Friday at 4 is the regular class. I'm, I'm yeah, Friday at 4. Uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m.? Wednesday at 2? Yes, 2. 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 Y
We have seen that the unit ball of a Banach space is never compact in the strong topology if the space is, space is infinite dimension. Okay? But we have a way to correct that somehow. I mean, and this Banach algorithm says that the unit ball of the dual space, so it's compact. In the weak star topology. Okay. This is one of the highlights of the discussion that we had. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about, last week, we talked a little bit about reflexive spaces and separable spaces. So reflexive means that. Remember, there is always a copy. You have E, you have E, line above E, you have the dual, line above the dual, you have the bidual. These are the spaces of the linear functionals on E, spaces of the linear functionals on E star, and so on. There is always a copy of E sitting inside E double star, right? So this is the map we call J from E to E double star that assigns, a, say, a vector x into the element jx on the byte dual. And I have to tell you how jx acts in a function f of the dual. This is just by definition, so f acting in x, which is OK, because f is an element in the dual, and x is an element in the x. OK? This, this defines a, it's actually an isometry. Right? It's a continuous linear map, which is actually isometric. And therefore, so there is a copy J of e that sits, the image of this map sits inside this space. And we define, we say that the space is reflexive when this copy here that lies inside is actually perfect. It's the whole thing. You know, the whole thing about defining the weak and the weak star topology on the dual, so if you are on the dual, you have the weak topology of the dual, which is given by making the maps on the by dual continuous. And the weak star topology is actually finer, it's, it's, it's weaker. It makes not all the maps here continuous, but just the maps in this subspace continuous. Okay? So of course, but when they are the same, then the weak and the weak star topology are the same on the dual, all right? OK, so one of the theorems that we studied was this theorem of, uh, this theorem of Kakutani, which somehow brought us back from the information on the ball of the dual being compact to the ball in the space, so if E so E is uh, Banach space, then so there was a statement like this, E is reflexive if and only if the unit ball is compact in the uh, weak topology. unit ball is compact in the weak topology. So space is reflexive. If the unit ball is compact, it will never be compact in the strong topology. Don't forget that. It may be compact in the weak topology. This is if the space is reflexive. <coughs> okay? And this has had a nice application. The application of this is the, say, the weak pre-compactness of sequences. So if you are E in a reflexive space, Banach reflexive space, uh, and uh, Xn was a bounded sequence, then there exists a weekly Convergent 
subsequence. This is also one of the highlights if you are in a reflexive space. Every bounded sequence has a weakly convergent subsequence. Okay? Some x and k that converges weakly to some point x in your space. Maybe this, this area is not too nice. Convergence weakly. Uh, do you all remember this thing? This is one of the nice things that you should take from this course too. Okay, so there are a few. I know that you are doing a high workload of exercises and exams, and uh, I promise you it will pay off. When you finish this course, you have in your sleep some highlights of the course. When you go to dream, you see every bounded sequence has a weakly <laughs> subsequence, <laughs> flexor space. The unit ball of the duo is compact in the weak star topology. You know, uh, you remember these theorems and you won't forget. So we proved this, and remember, to prove these things, uh, we had to go over a little bit on the discussion of separable spaces, right? So there's the discussion about reflexive spaces, and there was the discussion also on separable spaces. And separable spaces is a space, it's a very simple definition, it's just a space that admits a countable and dense subset. Okay? Uh, no way. So, we have seen statements that uh, say E is separable and uh, reflexive, if and only if the dual is separable and reflexive. Uh, we have seen a lot of theorems in this direction. Uh, and we ended up using this fact also to prove this, this theorem. It's not just a, a, a statement about being compact. So we had somehow to prove that the topology, the, the weak topology, the unit ball here is metrizable. Okay, so this is somehow sometimes uh, reflected by the property that these stars are separable. But we went all over this. Uh, and what I want to do next is to actually put this framework, which is so far is a little bit abstract. I want to fill you guys with examples, with the basic examples that you will be working with. So we have discussed a lot about reflexive spaces, separable spaces, and the unit ball here and the unit ball there, but I mean, what is the space that we usually work on? What are the things that we actually put our hands on? So the next few classes will be, we're going to talk again about LP spaces, we're going to talk about spaces of continuous functions. We're going to talk about Hilbert spaces. If we have time, we're going to talk a little bit so about Sobolev spaces. And uh, one of the questions that I would like now to be, we will be in position to answer is that if I ask you LP space, so if I give you L2, is it a reflexive space? Is it a separable space? So we have defined all these things. Now let's prove that some concrete spaces are reflexive, are separable or are not reflexive, why? It's not separable, why? And so on. What's the dual? What are the, what's the dual of LP? We're going to prove that the dual of LP is LP prime, and so on. So we're going to do these things again. So this is for tomorrow and Friday. So we're going to go back to LP spaces, which is the topic of chapter 4 of Brazil's. Some of the discussion on chapter 4 we already did in the beginning of the course, like convolution, these approximations of the identity that he discusses here in chapter 4. I think this is a, a material of independent interest of that you should actually, you probably could have seen in the course in real analysis. But then we're going to go back to chapter 4 to complete this. And, okay. uh, so one of the tools to prove that we're going to use to prove that LP is reflexive when P is not 1 or infinity, so P beats strictly between 1 and infinity, we're going to prove that this space is reflexive. Later on, we're going to prove that every Hilbert space is also reflexive. And the two to prove these things, well, there are different ways to prove it, but I think this is a nice tool we're going to do like the book suggests, is to prove that these spaces, the norms are uniformly convex norms. We're going to prove that every uniformly convex space is reflexive. Okay, this is what I want to do today. The class today might be slightly technical, but the final result, the final theorem that we're going to prove today, that any uniformly convex space is reflexive, 
will justify the, the, the class because we're going to use this theorem at least a couple of times later. Uh, okay. And this fits well, maybe, if you remember correctly. We didn't prove, well, I stated this theorem, but I just proved one part. I just proved that if the space is reflexive, then the ball is compact in the weak topology because this is what was needed to prove this thing. So I left this open for you guys to take a look and we're going to review that. Hopefully you already took a look at the proof and we can uh, discuss. So what we're going to do now is to prove this implication back and to prove this theory. That's the goal for today. All right? Okay, so we're going to prove four results. Two lemmas, this result, and this result. And then we're going to have a nice cup of coffee and discuss what you guys did on the exam. All right? <laughs> Good. You know, I thought you guys liked to write. I mean, I just put questions that you should write because you asked me to. I actually wanted to put multiple choice exams, but you discouraged me. In the last class, I asked, yeah, I'd like to put some. When I did functional analysis exams in IMPA, in Rio, in Brazil, back when I was working there, I used to put like 10 questions of just for the students to mark true or false. I'd put that a sentence, is that true or false? And you see, from the point of view of the teacher, that is almost a paradise to grade, right? <laughs> because you waste, really, you lose like five minutes to grade. But I would do this with a, with a, with a, with a caveat, right? So you guys like that I, you guys know that I don't like false claims in this class. So I like everyone to know what they're doing. This is correct, this is wrong, or I don't know. So there are just three possibilities. This is correct, this is wrong, or I don't know. There is no such thing, oh, I think this is correct. No, this is not a possibility, okay? Either it's correct, either it's wrong, or either you don't know. So I put this in the true or false. So I would say every correct answer is worth a point, every incorrect answer is worth minus one point, and of course you can leave it blank, and it's worth zero points. After I assigned these exams at IMPA, the students would gather and form a committee to me, and politely request that I never do an exam like this again. <laughs> because the outcome was, was kind of very bad. Have anyone did minus grade? <laughs> well, I, I had agreed with the, I had stated in the exam that the, the final grade of the exam overall, because this was just one question, there were like two, two, two or three questions to write. It was a part of the rules of the exam that no grade can be negative in the exam, but the grade for that particular problem could be neg negative, and it was in some cases. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, for a minute I thought about doing something like this. I thought that guys would do well, but maybe for the final, right? What do you guys <laughs> think? <laughs> uh, good, let's see. Okay, so let's let's prove. So we have four results in front of us to prove. Let's let me state it, and then we are going to. Prove. Okay, so we're going to need two lemmas, and I'm going to say two lemmas which are of of independent interest. So let's see. So this let, let me call lemma one. This is a lemma B. Heli, and let's say let E be a Banach space. And uh, let f1, f2, fk be k functionals in the dual, and gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma k be real numbers. Be given. Let this guy be given. The following. Equivalent, and this is the fault. Let's just see. Uh, for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an x epsilon belongs to E such that oh, x epsilon less than bigger than one. That Fi 
acting on this x epsilon minus gamma i. This is less than epsilon for each i 1 to 2 to i, or as it k. And the second statement is that a sum of 1 to k of beta i gamma i is less than or equal than the norm beta i f i for any beta 1 beta k real numbers. Okay. We'll see in a minute a little bit of a geometric interpretation of this result. We're going to try to prove that this space here uh, is going to be dense in that space. In the weak start topology. So we're going to use this fact. Let's see. Okay. Let's see if you understand the statement of what I'm proposing. So I'm having a Banach space E, and I give you k functionals, and I give you k real numbers. So what I'm saying is that given this, this data, for any epsilon, there exists an x epsilon in the unit ball, such that fi acting on x epsilon is very close to gammas for all the, the k's. This is equivalent to saying that for any sequence of beta 1, beta k, the sum of beta i gamma i in absolute value, this is just a real number, loses to the norm of beta i f i in the space, in the dual space. This is where it lives. So now let's do this. Let's prove that 1 implies 2, and let us prove that 2 implies 1. So 1 implies 2. So let's say, given beta 1, beta 2, but okay, uh, what I want to do is to, let's say this is given, uh, I just have to use the number one, right? So the number one says that for any epsilon there exists this x epsilon. So we'll just take these equations here, I'll we'll just take these, so this is just fi acting on x epsilon minus gamma i less than epsilon. I will just multiply by the, I, this is all I can use. So given my betas, what I can do is take this expression and just multiply by beta. I uh, here, here, and then here this would be beta i. Okay? And I can just add them up. Sum from i to 1 to infinity, not to infinity, but to k. Okay, so this is what I want to do. Now let's see. So I have these. So this implies that uh, what I want to evaluate is this guy. So from triangle inequality, uh, beta i, gamma i. Uh, Is, this is what I want to have, maybe it's less than or equal than, let's say, beta i, f i, how do I want to do this? What can you tell me here? Um, pa -pa 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 -pa. This is what I want to do. Multiply by beta i this expression. That's fine. I have this outside. Now I want to. I want somehow to be in position to add this up. I think we can say that this absolute value is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the first summit minus the absolute value of the second summit. And then we 
Yeah, yeah but they don't want to put the absolute value here yet because. No, I mean it's the first inequality you have. So uh, what I will do? Yeah. Maybe I want to somehow. Yes, some I want to remove this. So I, I will. What I will do is I will remove these bars. Okay, mm -hmm. here, if you allow me. And I'll say that this is less, bigger than minus epsilon times the absolute values of the n. Is that okay? Okay, now I will sum, I will sum this from, say, 1 to k. I will sum this from 1 to k. I will sum this from 1 to k. Let's just agree that the sum of the modules of the vi's, 1 to k, I'm going to call it, say, I don't know, big a. Big, big, big. Let's just call this number. This is fixed, right? The pi's are fixed. So what I have here is that minus epsilon times this big B is less than less than the well this is all linear, so this is just the sum of the pi's fi's with xe minus the sum of the beta i's gamma i's, which is less than epsilon times this big B. Okay? So what you find here is that certainly this sum, now let's just move this guy to both sides, so you find that the sum of beta i's, f i's, with x e, loses to, be careful, there is just a bracket here and a, a, a lower sign, loses to the sum of beta i's, gamma i's, plus epsilon b, and of course it wins against uh, let's say minus epsilon b. And here you can just put the modulus here. Put the modulus to the right and then put the minus the modulus to the left. You can certainly put that. Is that okay? Okay, so, so what this says is what this says is that the modulus of this thing inside, sum of beta i, f i, epsilon x e, loses to sum of beta i, gamma i. I should have done the opposite. I'm sorry, guys. This is what we want to bound, right? Yeah. So let me let me flip things. Did something wrong here? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let me forget here. I should just have isolated this guy here. This is not what I want to do. I want to keep this guy here minus sum of d i gamma i. Then I want to put epsilon b plus this other one or minus this one. Right? And then here, minus epsilon b, minus this guy. Okay? So in other words, what I find here is that the sum of beta i, gamma i, the one in the middle, loses, obviously, to, if you want, uh, epsilon b plus the absolute value of this sum of beta i of i. Okay. Since this is just it's just a functional, right? This is just a functional acting on a vector which has norm less than or equal than one. So this is less than or equal than epsilon times b plus the norm of this function. Okay. Now again, big B was fixed, and this holds for any epsilon, right? So since this holds for any epsilon bigger than zero, we have that we have well we have what we have two. This holds. Okay? Good. So it's just a matter of writing one, multiplying by beta i's and summing them up.
Now let's prove the converse. Let's prove that 2 implies 1. How would we do this? Let's see if we can follow the steps. Let's see if we follow the rocks here. So I want to prove now. Now 2 holds, meaning that for any betas, this inequality holds. I want to prove that given epsilon, I can get as close as I want from the gamma i's with the same x epsilon. Okay? So the trick now is to construct, consider a map, let's call it phi. This map phi will go from, what do I want? Let's say I want to go from E to RK. So this map is going to be given by the following, say phi of x. It's just going to be, say, f1 acting in x, f2 acting in x, fk acting in x. Okay? This is a map, a linear map from E to RK for its coordinates. f1 acting in this point x, f2 acting in x, fk acting in x. All right? So what you want to show is that for some choice of so what you want to show see we write and so we want to show that the point gamma which is gamma 1 gamma 2 gamma k belongs to the phi of the unit ball closure. So somehow that I can get a guy in the unit ball such that the phi of these guys will be very close to this gamma i, as close as I want. So somehow I want to show that this gamma belongs to this closure. This closure in the, in the norm of RK, of course. The norm of RK here you can just take the all the norms are equivalent. It's a finite dimensional space, so you can take just the sum or the, or the maximum of these things, or the square norm, whatever you want. They're all equivalent, okay? So why is uh, gamma is in the closure of y? We want to show. We want to show this. No, no, I mean, why is this equivalent uh, to be of radius epsilon, right? I'm we, just... Uh, we want to show that there's a point x for any epsilon bigger than zero, that's a point x epsilon in the unit ball, such that the image of these guys get very close, each coordinate gets very close to the corresponding gamma. So this point in RK gets very close to this point in RK. So in other words, I want to show that this point here belongs to this image of the unit ball, the closure. Okay? Is that clear? Or not yet. Not yet. So what's your question? I see. So my question is here to, to, where is epsilon? Epsilon is not here we we have a choice of epsilon, but here why we need to choose it's for every epsilon. It's for every epsilon. Yeah, but I'm just not understanding why B E. B E is the unit ball E. Right? So this is what I want to prove. So I, I'm given this fact. Mm -hmm. I'm giving this fact. So these are all given functions. Gamma i's are all given. Uh -huh. And I'm giving you this. Mm -hmm. So I want to prove that for any epsilon, there exists an x epsilon in the unit ball such that this is less than epsilon. The equation would give you the epsilon. We mean the closure of this image. The closure takes care of the epsilon. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You understand now? Yeah. Okay. So this is what we want to show. And this is the kind of ge geometric interpretation of this result here. Now, uh, suppose this is not true. Suppose this is not true. And then you have one typical case where you have to use, you have, suppose gamma does not belong to this phi of the unit ball closure. You have a typical case where you're in point to use which theorem? Combine, right? You have a point, gamma. You have a linear map. The unit ball is a convex set. 
This is a linear map, so this is be, going to be a convex set. You take the closure, this is going to be a closed and convex set. So we have a closed and convex set, phi of phi e. So is it the most, is the easiest application of Hambanak? This is Hambanak in RK, right? So you have a compact, just a point, in a closed convex set. So by Hambanak, well, by Hambanak in finite dimensions, you don't even have to, to know what Hambanak is just by linear algebra. So there exists a hyperplane that separates strictly these two guys. But a lot, what is a hyperplane? A hyperplane in in RK. A hyperplane in I, RK is just a, a yeah. You just have to get the normal vector, right? This is a hyperplane, say, given by. Let's say p1, p2, beta k as a normal vector that separates them. So again, this 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 hyperplane H is just a hyperplane given by say sum sum of beta i x i equal to alpha. That's the equation of the hyperplane. If x i are the coordinates, the beta i is the coefficients, and alpha is just a a fine hyperplane. So what does it mean? Well, if I just put the equation of this hyperplane on these guys, so this will mean that the sum of sum of beta i's times this x i is here, which are these fellows, f i with x from 1 to k will be less than alpha, and alpha will be less than the sum of beta i's, gamma i's. So one guy will be on one side of the hyperplane, one guy will be on the other side of the hyperplane. This will hold for this particular choice of beta i's, which are the duct. But now, well, this has to hold now, remember, for all x in the unit mall. For all x in the unit mall. Okay? So this is sum of beta i's, f i's, all x. This is linear. This is less than alpha. This is less than. Now we are in some sort of situation that we have seen before. Since this is now a fixed functional, and you have an inequality that holds for all x, so you can, for example, change x by minus x. So this, 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 this alpha certainly cannot be negative, because if you change x by minus x, it would go to positive. Right? So this alpha has to be positive. Moreover, so you're applying uh, a certain functional in all x in the unit mole, and this quantity is always less than this alpha. So this implies that a norm of this, which is just the supremum of these quantities over all x in the unit ball. The supremum, every guy loses to alpha, the supremum is certainly less than or equal to alpha. It could be equal. But certainly alpha loses on the other side of this. And this is a contradiction because this is exactly the opposite of condition 2 for this particular uh, sequence beta i's. Property 2 said that you could you could not have this for any sequence of beta i's. I'm contradicting one. This is a contradiction. Good. Okay. So this is our first technical result that we need today. How are we doing? Time. Five. Bang. Good. 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 Lemma two. And my tools due to Goldstein. And now well, this is exactly what we wanted to prove. So let, let E be a Banach space. Then the image of the unit ball through the map J, J of BE is dense. 
in the unit ball of the tool, the right tool, in the topology. And the weak star topology of the byte rule. Therefore, J of E expands with E. result. We have already seen that this J map is an isometry between E and the, it's, well, it's a subset. This, this isometry sends this unit ball into a subset of the unit ball of the byte ball. It's an isometry, so this guy is a subset of this guy. It's an isometric copy. If it were everything, that's what we wanted to prove. For example, if, if this were equal to this, then this space would be reflexive. But generally, it's, it's not everybody, it's not everything. But what we're proving is that, well, it's not everything, but it's still a lot in the sense that this set here is dense in the unit ball of the Baidu in the weak star topology of the Baidu. Topology of the guys in the Baidu given by the maps of the previous guys. So this is the weak star topology of the Baidu. You know, I hope that at this point, this conversation about the weak topologies and the weak star topologies are becoming more familiar to you, okay? So this is the topology on the Baidu given by the map of the duel, so this is the weak star topology of the Baidu. So, so look at the level of sophistication that we're talking about. So if we prove this, therefore, well, if I prove that the image of the unit ball here is dense in the unit ball of the target space, then by just simple dilation, the image of the whole space is going to be dense in the whole by dual in this weak star topology, right? Because I can just dilate the neighborhoods. So if I if I if I get a point here E double star in a neighborhood and I want to find a guy there that's close, what I do is that I just dilate this neighborhood to the unit ball, find appropriate uh, guy that is dense, and I go back. So the dilations of this neighborhood are are, are allowed in the, when you work with the weak star topology. Good. Okay, let's prove this fact. Proof. So, what do we want to show? Okay, so let, now let's again follow what would be the natural steps and let's see if we get stuck somewhere. So, again, with, it's important to you guys at this moment, I, I want you to acknowledge maybe that you feel how much you have learned so far in terms of gaining. Uh, the ability of to prove these results and uh, I want you to be able to use everything that you have learned so far especially when you try to do a proof you try to follow the natural steps and see where you get stuck so here let's try to follow what the natural steps would be and let's see if we get stuck somewhere so if I want to prove that J of B is dense in this unit ball so what I do is I let eta be a guy in this unit ball of the double duo and let V be a neighborhood of eta in this topology. What's the next step? Okay, I got the point. So, so I got the point in that neighborhood. I have to find proof that I, I have an image of somebody in that neighborhood. The next step here, if we have followed this class so far, is that without loss of generality, we may assume we may assume what? That V is not at this neighborhood V is formed by the guys uh, 
let's say, C. In an E double star. An E double star, such that C minus eta acting on some F i's. Last time. For some i say 1, 2, k. For some k functions, right? So I can assume that my neighborhood is like that. Good. So what I do, what I have to find is we must find, we must find uh, c equals to jx belonging to this neighborhood. I want to find a j of x in this neighborhood, right? With uh, x belonging in the unit ball of b. So this would mean that. Um... So let's rewrite this. So if j x belongs to the neighborhood, this happens if and only if. If c is j x, so this means that the absolute value of j x f i minus eta f i would be less than epsilon. Or i equals 1, 2 to the k. This would have to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But what is jx acting on a function of fi? fi of x. Fi of x. See, we're already here using a lot of functional analysis, okay? I mean, if we were here on day one, this would be completely Greek to you. I mean, unless someone here is Greek, which is not the case, this would be, be hard, right? But now, uh, so this is fi minus x minus eta fi would have to be less than epsilon from i1 to the k. But these are given things, right? Eta is given. These fi's are given because they're, they define the neighborhood. So how about we call these guys these numbers, which are just real numbers. Let's just call them gamma i. Okay, so what we have to show is that fi x minus this gamma i are less than epsilon for i1 to k. You can use hilly? Yes. So this is, we are not in position to use what we proved before, right? So we're given a certain gamma i's and we're given f i's and we have to find x in the unit ball such that this is less than epsilon for these guys. But we know that from the previous lemma, from the previous lemma, We know that we can do this, we can find such x, we can do this, provided that we have what? That we have the sum of, uh, what was it? Sum of bi gamma i in modulus less than or equal to the sum of the bi's, fi's in all. If we had this, we'll be okay. Now let's just check that this is true. <coughs> In fact, this is true. Let's see. Well, sum of B i gamma i is just the sum of bi. What is gamma i? Gamma i is just eta acting on fi. Just eta acting on fi. Which is just the sum, the bilinearity eta acting on sum of bi fi. Since eta is in the unit ball of the bidual, if it acts into any guy in the dual, this will be less than or equal than the norm of eta, which is less than 1, to the norm of this, which is what you want. Right? Since the norm of eta is the bi dual. Okay. So we are all set. happens in all spaces. The J of E, the J map, may not be all the bidual, but it's always dense in the weak star topology of the bidual. This is quite interesting. Good.
I'm just to have a, like a philosophical question. Um, in in the, the proof of theory itself, when we use the Hambanach, you mentioned that we can use the finite dimensional case. Right? Yeah. But now we are getting a, a, a result about even infinite dimension. Yeah. So I think that's a little bit weird. Uh, that Does this usually when we have to prove something for infinite dimensional, so we have to invoke something like axiom of choice or? No, I mean this is just a consequence of the. Remember, if you think about it, the way we use Hamban in finite dimensions was just because the neighborhoods on the weak topology of the weak star topology are always given in terms of basic neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and these basic neighborhoods are always f a finite overlap of of the basic neighborhoods, right? So. This is how we got to use this in, in finite dimension thing. It's not so, you should not worry too much about this. Okay, so let's have this fact at our disposal. One more fact to put in our pockets. The image through the J-map of E may not be the whole white wool, but it's always dense in the weak star topology of the white wool. Now let's investigate the proof of what's missing of Katutani. Theorem of Catatelli, the reverse. Catatelli. What we want to prove now is that if the unit ball on the space E is compact in the weak topology, then E is reflexive. Okay. This is just the, the missing part. Uh, assuming that BE is, of course, the reverse we already proved. If the space is reflexive, then the unit ball is compact in the weak topology. Now, if the unit ball is compact in the weak topology, let's prove that the space is reflexive. With what we have in hand, it's. Uh, Again, as this course proceeds, or as any mathematical course proceeds, we have to be able to absorb the results that we have learned and to be able to draw the weapons. So every result is a weapon, you just go pull them up. Knives, pistols, guns, and so on. Okay, so it's all at your disposal. Uh, what we have to do here is Let's see. Uh, so we have to investigate this map J, right? So we want we have this map J that goes from E to E double star. Okay. The first thing I want to this is a map that goes from E to E double star. First thing I want to mention to you is that this map is continuous. But I want to consider the topology. So whenever, be, be careful, whenever I say that such a map is, okay, this is a continuous map, you have to ask me, or you should ask yourself, say, it's continuous in which topologies are we talking about? Continuity in this sense means it's a map between the topological space to another topological space such that the pre image of open sites is open. Okay, so I'm going to take this space with the topology, with the weak topology, and I'm going to map in this space with this weak star topology. And the first claim that I make to you is that this is a continuous map. Hmm? This is a continuous map from this space with this topology and this space with this topology. Now we had a little bit of a conversation uh, in saying that if my topology is somehow generated by making some maps continuous, the way that I have to check if a certain map from P, this space, is continuous that if I compose with these maps that define the topology here, and the whole thing is continuous. Remember this, this discussion. So 
to show this, it is sufficient to verify that for all, all maps defining this topology here, so all f in the dual, right? When you compose, when you send this j, and you get a point x here, and you center point j of x, and you center j of x, acting f, I want to verify that this map here, the composition is continuous from well, the first space from E with this topology to R. The end point is R. Right? So we had this discussion. So whenever I have a topological space that is defined as all of these weak topologies are by making a certain collection of maps continuous, and then I have a map from one of these spaces to another, the way to show that this map is continuous is that if I compose to one of the defining maps here, and show that the, the, the remaining operations continues from here to R. So this, remember, this starts in, in E, and goes to E double star, and this goes to R. So I'm doing a composition of these two maps, the J and the F. But what is this map that sends E to Jx acting on F? What is this Jx acting on F? This is just, this is just F of X. So I'm, I'm telling you that I want that the map that sends x to f of x be continuous yes. on this topology E generated by the maps in E star. I want that this map be, be continuous. Oh, but this is just the definition of the weak topology. Okay, so this is just, this is just by the definition. So this is just a matter of understanding what the definitions are. Okay, so this is this is not deep at all. Okay, it's just a matter of understanding the definitions of the weak topology. So if you compose with a map in this space, what you get is a map that sends. So I want I want all the maps f that send f well f of x for f in the dual to be continuous in this topology. But this are this is just a definition of this topology. Is that clear? Okay, so. We have a map that is clear. We have a map that is continuous from this topological space to this topological space. I, I have as a hypothesis for my, for my theorem here that the, the unit ball is compact. The unit ball of this space is compact. So a continuous map takes compact into compact. You can just prove this is very basic. So if you take the pre image of open sets is, is open, it's not that the pre image of compact is compact. It's not true. The image of compact is compact. Okay, you can probably prove this from the definition. So, uh, so since B E is compact with respect to the topology, right? And this topology from E, this weak topology, then this implies that the image, let's say J of B E, is compact. In E double star with this topology. If it's compact, then it's closed. This implies that J of B E is closed in this topology. Okay, again, basic fact from topology, it's compact, it's closed. Uh, but now we use the previous lemma. What have we proved? We proved that this guy was dense. So if it's closed and it's dense, it must be the same. Okay? So let's close. 
Well, I mean, it's compact, and we have seen it's an isometry, right? So let's 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 actually put B E double star. Let's just put B E double star because we have seen it's an isometry. It not only maps into E double star, but maps into uniform. So it's compact in here. It's therefore it's closed from the previous lemma. From the previous lemma, it is. Dense, therefore, that implies that it has to be the whole thing. But close itself that is dense, it has to be the whole thing. So the J of the unit ball in E is the unit ball of the bidual. Therefore, by dilation, J of the space is the bidual. And the space is reflexive as you want. Okay, so this is the remaining part of Kastanisti. So now you know how to prove that a space is reflexive if and only if the unit ball is compact in the weak topology. Are you guys still here with me? Do you have energy for one more? Okay, so one more result. Good. Okay, so this was just a matter of yeah. the big thing the big thing was this, this previous lemma that we proved, right? The image is, is actually dense in this week's technology. It's very beautiful when you put all these things in functional analysis together. It's very beautiful to see how the pieces combine together and you get such strong results. You learn how to prove them once, it's important. But now for the rest of your life you just use it. Just use it, just use it. Good. Questions? Good. Somebody's missing from the class today. Asim. Where is he? He's sick. He's sick. Oh, wishing my best. Asim, if you're following the videos, man, come back <laughs> soon to us. We miss you. Okay, so in the last uh, moment of the class today, I want to talk to you a little bit about this uniformly convex spaces. And this is a very nice uh, way to prove that a space is reflexive. This is probably the most common way to prove that some space is reflexive. It's very actually hard if, you, if I give you a space to prove that the map J of E gives the whole thing J of E the bidual. This is usually one way that we're going to use to prove, for example, that the LP spaces are re reflexive or the Hilbert spaces are reflexive. This is a direct way to prove. Uh, and uh, what's the definition of uniformly convex spaces? So here I will be working with the Banach space, and this is essentially that, another way to say this is just saying that the unit ball is round, okay? So if you recognize a space being uniform and convex, you say that the unit ball is round. The unit ball looks like a ball, right? So if you see, say, in R2, with the, the norm 2, the Euclidean ball is like this. So if you are in R2 with the norm, say, of the L-infinity norm, the ball is like this, as the unit ball. So this is a uniformly convex space. This is not a uniformly convex space because the ball is not round. The ball has segments. Well, what's the definition? So the definition here is the following. So let we say that a Banach space E is uniformly convex if for each epsilon bigger than zero. There exists 
Now I can make it as here, such that. If x and y in the unit ball, let's put this. Let's see if this is the way to find it. x and y in the unit ball are such that their distance is bigger than epsilon. In the unit ball. So let me just write this. If x and y are such that, let's say, norm of x is less than or equal to 1, norm of y is less than or equal to 1, norm of x minus epsilon is, uh, I want bigger than epsilon, then norm of x plus y over 2 is smaller than 1 minus that. This is what I So we say that a Banach space is uniformly convex if for each epsilon bigger than 0, there exists a delta such that following holds. If x and y are points in the unit ball whose distance is bigger than epsilon, then the absolute value, the norm of the average, is less than 1 minus delta. You know that the norm of the average is always less than 1, less than or equal to 1 by the triangle inequality. But what I'm saying is that if your points x and y are somehow separated, when you average them, you go a little bit inside the ball. So if they are separated, you go a little bit inside the ball. This has been uniformly convex. Okay? Obviously, this is not the case here. Why would 1 minus delta be mechanical? Just the condition, just the delta, or 1 minus delta, is it simply smaller than 1? Well, again, the delta depends on the epsilon, right? For each epsilon, there exists a delta such that for any two points inside the unit ball whose distance is bigger than epsilon, then their average will be less than 1 minus delta. You have moved delta inside the ball. Okay? The point is, I think, because as epsilon gets smaller, naturally we would like... Uh, delta, delta will get smaller. smaller. So yes. 1 minus delta approaches 1, therefore this is what happens. Like It's going to become more closer to the... Yeah, absolutely. When, when, now, when epsilon goes to 0, delta goes to 0 as well. Okay. But at this point, I mean, it doesn't matter if, if delta is epsilon squared, epsilon cubed. It's just some function of epsilon. For any epsilon, you have a delta, a positive delta such that that far. This is what we call uniformly convex space. And the theorem that we're going to prove is that this theorem here. Is it Milman Pettis? Yes, Milman Pettis. Uh, every uniformly convex space is reflexive. Okay, but why is that infin as an infinity norm is not uh, uniformly convex? This is the ball, right? If you take this point here and this point here. Their distance is some, some, it's not zero, mm -hmm. but their average has still norm one. Yeah, yeah. So your 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 ball mm -hmm. cannot contain lines. Your ball has to be round. Mm -hmm. This is what it's. Just remember, the ball has to be round. Every uniformly convex space is reflexive. It's very nice. So this is one tool to prove that a space is reflexive, to try to prove that it's uniformly convex. Okay? Now, be very careful with one observation. I want to make this observation here because it's a little bit subtle. Uh, being reflexive is a topological property of the space. Okay? So, so if you have two equivalent norms, 
you know that the continuous linear functions will be the same, and then the byte will be the same, so the space will be reflexive for any of the equivalent norms. Now, being uniformly convex is not necessarily a, a topological property, it's a geometric property. You know, you can have two equivalent norms in the same space, one of which is uniformly convex and the other one is not. I am not saying that every reflexive space has to be uniformly convex. I'm saying that if you have your space and you can find, say, an equivalent norm which is uniformly convex, then you, have, you can prove that your space is reflexive. This is one way to prove that your space is reflexive, but it's certainly not the only way. Okay? So for some moment, it was an open question to see whether every reflexive space admits an equivalent norm which is uniformly convex, but this turned out to be false. There are pathological spaces up there which are reflexive that do not admit uh, a uniformly convex norm. Okay? Just to clarify this. Good. Let's first prove this. This is a very nice proof. And then this will be the last result of our class today. Okay. Uh, are we clear? Very nice. Let's see. Let, let's follow the let's follow the steps again. Let C be a guy in the byte rule. Okay? With Norm 1. Let's see the guy in the by dual with C norm 1. So what I want to show is that every guy in the by dual, I have just normalized it to have norm 1. This is what I want to do. Yeah. I want to show that every guy in the by dual is just an image J of X for some X. Okay, so without loss of generality, I'm taking a guy in the by dual, I'm dilating to have norm 1. So I want to show that this guy is J of X. So what I want to show is that uh, what do I want to show? Let me first show that every neighborhood, right? So let's show, so what I want to show, let's show, uh, we show that this C belongs to the image of the unit. This is what I want to show, right? So. Since J of B E, the image of the unit mode, is closed in the unit of the door, closed in the five door. In the strong topology, it's closed in the strong topology because it's an isometry right so the image of the bow is closed in the by dual is it me yes let's see maybe there's an emergency to the class since it's closed in the strong topology what we have to do is uh, let's see it is to show that for each no, for each epsilon bigger than zero, there exists x in the unit ball with uh, c minus j x less than or equal to x. This is what I want. Okay, this is it. It's sufficient to show that for each epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an x in the unit ball of E with x, c minus jx less than epsilon. In the strong, the strong topology, this is the norm. Okay. Uh, now, fix epsilon, fix epsilon bigger than zero, and let Delta be bigger than zero B. Uh, so called modulus of uniform convexity. When I say fix epsilon bigger than zero and let delta be the modulus of uniform convexity, I mean fix epsilon bigger than zero and let delta be this delta that verifies the definition here. 
Okay? For this epsilon. Good. Uh, let's see. What we're going to do is we choose F in the dual. We're going to choose F in the dual with norm of F in the dual uh, equals to 1 and such that the C acting on F is bigger than 1 minus delta over 2. Okay? That's what I'm doing. So recall that C is a guy with norm 1 in the bidual. So what I'm doing is that I'm taking a guy F in the dual with norm 1 that almost realizes this norm. Okay, so I'm taking a guy C. Remember, the, the norm of C is the soup of C acting on, on F of such guy. The norm is 1. So I'm taking a, an F such that this is bigger than 1 minus this delta over 2. Good. Now, now let's define this. Now, define this neighborhood V, which is eta belonging to the bidual, such that eta minus C acting in F, this F, this F now is fixed, uh, is less than delta over 2. Okay. This is a neighborhood of C in which topology? In the topology of C double star given by the maps side, the weak star topology, right? It's a neighborhood of Xi given by the maps F, weak star topology. It's just formed by, usually the neighborhoods are this for certain Fi's, it's just for one functional F. Okay. It's a neighborhood of this guy in this topology. As we have seen, we have seen, I'm going to use again the lemma of Goldstein. We have seen that J of B E is dense in E double star with this topology. Right? Therefore, if I have a neighborhood of this guy, there will be one point of J of B in this neighborhood. This implies that there exists an X in the unit ball such that J of X belongs to this neighborhood V. So far, so good. Claim this X, this is our required x required for this star okay this x verifies this star condition let's prove this proof proof inside the proof if not Suppose this x does not verify this condition. Not. We would have what we would have. We would have a functional such that uh, we would have functional that c minus j of x would be bigger than epsilon. 
we would have that C would then belong to, let's put it this way, J of X plus Epsilon times a unit ball of the bidual complement. Right? This is the same thing as writing this. So you have here J of X. You're saying that the, the this is the norm. This is the actual norm, right? So saying that the, the distance from X to J of X is bigger than epsilon. It's just putting a little ball around Jx of radius epsilon, so Jx plus epsilon times the unit ball, and saying that x is outside of this ball, not x plus c. So x belongs to Jx. I'm putting the closed ball here, right? So the closed ball complement. So this is closed. This is the unit closed ball because this is bigger than epsilon, not bigger or equal than. So it's actually outside the closed ball. So this set here is. Okay, so now, before the complement, now I have to argue again with the web. I already have weapons to do with this. This is a, a convex and closed subset in the strong topology. So here inside, this is, this is convex and closed in the strong topology. This is just a unit ball. It's just a ball, a closed ball in the strong topology. But we have already seen that convex and closed in the strong topology implies that they are also convex and closed in the weak topology. That's what this is what I need. So this implies that this is also closed in the weak topology. So in the topology. We want it in the weak star topology. Yes, yes, I want I want somehow to show that this is a neighborhood in the weak star topology. Yes. How do I want to show this? Uh, no. Should I use this? So I want to conclude that this set here is open in the weak star topology, in the weak star topology, but this is okay. Uh, the way I want to do this is the following. It's not, I won't use this, I'm sorry, I want to use this because this will give me just a weak topology, not the, okay, so forget about this, sorry. Uh, I don't want to use cores and convex, I just want to use that B, the, the unit ball, the unit ball itself is just the, the set of etas such that sets of etas and the dual with norm less than or equal than one, but I can write such that uh, Eta acting on F is less than or equal than 1 for all F of norm 1. So this is just a, this is just an intersection of all F's of norm less than or equal than 1 of these guys. Okay. So you want to be here by intersection? It's the set of, of so, so the, the unit ball on the by duo is the set of guys in the dual space such that so if you want for all so this is that this is true such that eta acting on F is less than or equal than one for all F in E, so for all F in the unit ball of, of E. 
You agree? Yeah. In other words, this is the intersection of the, these neighborhoods, of these neighborhoods. Rho F. Rho F. Only plus number equal to 1. I take the intersection of the sets eta such that, well, eta acting in F is the number equal to 1. So fix an F. Fix an F. Okay? An F in the, in the dual. Now, this set here is a closed set. This is a closed set because it's just a printing image of a closed set in this, in the weak star topology. Okay, this is closed in the weak star topology and then any intersection of closed sets is actually closed. Okay, so, so each of these sets is, again, closed in the weak star topology. It's just a pretty image of the image of an interval, minus 1, 1. So each of these sets is closed in the weak star topology, then the intersection of, well, any sort of intersection countable or uncountable of closed sets is closed. So uh, what I'm trying to argue is that this set here is, this implies that the set here is actually closed in the This is closing the weak start topology. Okay. I think we might have already used this fact there, that the unit ball of the dual was closed in the weak start topology. The unit ball of the, okay, in other words, we're using Banaka low glue again. So the unit ball of the dual is compact in the weak start topology, right? Here, therefore closed. So this is what I'm using. Like the unit ball of the dual is, is compact and implies closed in the weak start topology. Then this set is closed in the weak start topology, then the complement is open. This is open. And the weak star topology. Right? This is a direct proof that the set is closed, but of course it could involve Banaka log is, is actually compact in the weak star topology, therefore closed. Why am I doing that? Well, because uh, you, you end up constructing another neighborhood. This is open in the weak star topology, so you constructed a neighbor, another neighborhood of C. Okay. So let's call this let's call this W. Let's call this W J X plus E times the unit ball complement. So this is a guy that so this is another neighborhood of C in this weak star topology. And I will use again the fact that J of PE is dense in the by wall. So I have another neighborhood W. So since J of B is dense. There exists a Y in the unit ball with J of Y belonging to this neighborhood W. Okay? So now it's a matter of reaching a contradiction. So let me see. Uh, pa -pa -pa -pa. And I'm actually going to put not only W as a neighborhood, I put this neighborhood here, yes? So I'm actually going to put J of Y in V in the section W. V was this original neighborhood here, okay? So V was, a, was an open set that contains C. This W is another neighborhood of C. So V intersection W is an open set. Since J of V is dense, there is a Y that lies in there. There was an X that lied inside this neighborhood, but this Y is a different guy because X does not lie inside this W neighborhood. 
Remember, this is a little ball around the j of x. So x is automatically ruled up. So y is another guy. So what you have here so is this. Uh, finally, just conclude as uh, j of x and j of y belong to v. What you have is, since they belong to this neighborhood v, what you have is that uh, Yes, mm -hmm. when I apply that, I have f acting on x minus c acting on f is less than delta over 2. If I want to put the absolute value here, as I do. And I have f acting on y minus c acting on f is less than delta over 2. Okay? Jx belongs to this neighborhood, so I can just plot in the place of eta here. So I have Jx acting on f minus c acting on f is less than delta over 2. But Jx acting on f is just f acting on x. So once I have this, it's just a matter of summing this up. So let me spare you of the details. If I sum, summing, what do I get is that, uh, let me just this. Uh, if I sum this up, I will get this. 2 c times f is less than uh, f acting on x plus y plus delta. Okay, so this is what I'm doing. So what I'm doing is just uh, pa -pa -pa -pa, If you allow me, uh, what I'm doing is I'm just changing the signs here, okay? So I'm just changing the signs here, changing the signs here, and removing the absolute value. So when I do this and I sum, I get on the left hand side 2 times c acting on f, and on the right side, I move this guy there, and move this guy there, I get f on x and f on y plus delta over 2 plus delta over 2. This gives me delta. So I get this. Okay? Uh, but what is the, remember this f, this f had not 1, right? So this guy here is less than or equal than the term of x plus y. Form of x plus y plus delta. Okay? Therefore, this implies that c acting on f is less than, now let me divide by 2 x plus y over 2 plus delta over 2. But from the very beginning, this c acting on f, this f was chosen such that c that had norm 1, f almost attained the norm. This was chosen in such a way that this was bigger than 1 minus delta over 2. And what you end up when you pass this delta over 2 to the other side, you end up showing that 1 minus delta is less than x plus y over 2, which contradicts the definition of delta in the modulus of continuity. Because, this, remember, jy was out of this ball of radius epsilon. So I, I didn't say about this then jy minus jx. It is you know, bigger than epsilon. Since j is an isometry, y minus x is bigger than epsilon. Therefore, by the definition of the modulus of continuity of uniform convexity, the x plus y over 2 would have to be less than 1 minus delta, and it's bigger. Okay, so this is how the contradiction is. Is that okay? Yes. All right. As I told you, we proved today four statements, four results. It's a little bit technical, perhaps above average for this class, but I think the results that we prove are nice and deserve to be proved, and now we're in position to use this for the next classes, okay? So today we proved the reverse of Kakuten's theorem, so now we know that every space is reflexive if and only if the unit ball is compact in the root topology. We proved two nice technical lemmas, the Henley's lemma and the Goldstein's lemma, especially to say that this that E is embedded in E double star. It's not usually the same, but it's always dense in the weak star topology. 
and then this nice way of proving that a space is reflexive. So if a space is uniformly convex, then it implies that it's reflexive, and this is the proof. Good. So next class, we're going to talk, so we finished the discussion here on chapter 3 of the book of Brazil. Next class, we move to chapter 4. We talk a little bit more about LP spaces tomorrow and Friday. And the first thing we, we want to discuss is when they are reflexive, when they are separable, let's take a look at some of, at some of these issues, okay? All right, so this is the end for today. We continue tomorrow at 2. Thanks, guys. See you all tomorrow. Okay, passed a little bit. Sorry. Oh, yes.